The story of Abraham's offering. Offering up of his son Isaac. Many actually think this is a strange command. It is actually a difficult portion of scripture to preach on. But it says in verse 1 that God did tempt Abraham, or he did test Abraham. You ever wonder why did he test Abraham? Why does God test people? Why does God test you? To draw? To draw you? Draw you to what? Draw you and me to discover the grace of God. That is why he tests us. Because we need to realize that God's grace is always sufficient. 1 Peter 1 verse 7 that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory, glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. When? At the appearing of Jesus Christ. That it might be found to praise and honor and glory. God was with Abraham. As we go through this story briefly, God was with Abraham. Abram had been walking with the Lord for approximately, if you study it up on it a little bit, it's approximately 45 years or so. And God had always been faithful to Abraham. You know why I say that? Because God is always faithful. Always. Maybe Abraham had not always been faithful to God, but God had always been faithful to Abraham. But Abraham had definitely matured. Abraham lived near Beersheba with Sarah and Isaac, that beloved child of his old age. And God calls Abraham. God was not finished with Abraham yet. He was not finished with developing and stretching Abraham's faith. So he calls him by name, verse 1. Abraham. I truly believe, the more I read this portion over and over, I truly believe that God respected and God loved Abraham. I, I truly believe that. Abraham was... A friend of God. He and the Lord had a good relationship. So when the Lord calls Abraham, what does Abraham do? He says, here I am. Behold, here I am. Just like that. Just a simple answer. And God says to him, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. That's heart-wrenching. That's a sword in your bones. No doubt about it. You know what he's saying to Abraham? Abraham, go kill your son. That's heart-wrenching. Take your son, not bullocks, not lambs, nor your son, and your only son, Isaac. This is a command. I want you to go kill him.
That Isaac, that name means laughter. That Isaac whom you love, you, you go take him to the land of Moriah. It was about a three days journey, we read. And you offer him there for a burnt offering. I don't only want you to kill your son, I want you to offer him up as a burnt offering. I want you to burn him. That's heart-wrenching. I want you to kill him, but not only that, I want you to kill him as a sacrifice. Abram had waited 25 years for Isaac. God had kept his promise that Isaac would come. Isaac had come. And now he tells him, you go kill him. We know that Sarah had miraculously conceived in her old age, and that Isaac was born. And you know what? Since Isaac's birth, Abraham had poured his life into that son, because that was a special son. Father and son, you could, we could say, they were enjoying each other's company. They had a wonderful closeness. And now God asks for a demonstration of Abram's love for him. And we don't have any verses here that tell us that Abraham questions God. You know why? I don't think God leaves any room for debate. This is a command. But it seems so against anything normal. And God gives Abraham no reason for it. But Isaac must die. And Abraham, you must do that. And neither one or the other knows why. Remember, this is Isaac, obedient, hopeful son. Was it not said that in Isaac thy seed shall be called? Hebrews eleven eighteen, I think, tells us that. How 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 would Abraham? Ever, ever look Sarah in, in the eye again? But Abraham, even though he doesn't understand, he rises early in the morning and tells us, saddles his donkey, and it doesn't say if he said anything to Sarah or not. W what would you say? What would you tell your wife? What could you say? But Abraham is obedient, rises up early, gets things ready for a sacrifice, and actually he even splits the wood, it says. Takes two of his young men with him and goes to the place where God has told him to go. Three days of walking with your son that's a long time, knowing you're going to do away with him. Three days of walking with your son, knowing that I have to do this, would hurt. He looks and sees the place, tells the young man to stay back. You stay back with the ass or the donkey, and I always wonder, okay, why would you tell those men to stay back there? The only thing I could come up is just to make sure they wouldn't try to get him to change his mind. Because Abram had to do this himself. He was asked to do this himself. But he gets his son Isaac to carry the wood. 
Verse 6, Abram took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. So he gets Isaac to even carry the wood. Abram carries the knife, fire in his hand, and a knife. And then they go up together. Isaac must have started to wonder. In verse 7, Isaac spake unto Abraham, and he said, My father... I'm sure Abraham knew the question that was coming. Can you imagine? There's nothing there to offer except the two of them. I'm sure Isaac knew the question. Behold the fire in the wood, but, but where, where's the lamb? And Abram doesn't tell him, you're the lamb. Abram doesn't tell him that. Do you notice that? Behold, verse 7, Isaac asked the fire in the wood, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? But Isaac, or Abram does not tell Isaac that you are, that supposed to be that lamb. All Isaac, Abraham says is, my son, God will provide. God will provide himself a lamb, verse 8, for a burnt offering. And you know what that is? That's an answer of obedience. Actually, what it really is, it's an answer of faith. God will provide. They go on, verse 9, and Abram's heart must have been, I don't think we can even put ourselves in that position as a, how heavy his heart must have been. The steps must have been weary. Can you imagine walking up here with your son and you're going to do away with him and, and you're walking up Finally, they arrive at the place, verse 9, they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abram builds that altar there. I'm sure it was the saddest one he ever built. Can you imagine building an altar that you're going to lay your son on and going to burn him there? He actually lays, even, lays the wood down. And now he has to tell him, Isaac, you are the lamb. We are not told one word about if Isaac fought it. Not a word. It seems that he, he was also willing to, to, to be that sacrifice. It seems like that. It seems as if he was as willing as Abraham was. No resistance, no, no trying to escape. But a sacrifice always has to be bound. You, you have to tie it up. So in verse 9, it tells us he bounds Isaac, his son. So can you imagine with cords, I'm sure he is tying him up, wrapping him up. And it must have tore the heart out of Abraham. It must have just tore his heart out. The hands that had held this beloved son. 
You know what I thought? I think those cords that he wrapped him in, they must have been totally wrapped in love. Completely. They were covered in love. But it must be done. So having bound him, he takes him and he lays him upon the altar. And I'm sure there were floods of tears rolling down Abraham's cheeks. It doesn't tell us that. But how can you imagine bounding your, bounding your son, tying him up together, and laying him on something, and you're going to slay him without tears rolling down your cheeks? His eyes must have lifted to heaven. And he takes the knife and he stretches out his hand. This is, church, this is an act of obedience. This is an act of faith. This is an act of faith beyond our imagination. Beyond our comprehension. It is a representation, actually, of the love of God to us. That's what it is. When he delivered his only begotten son to suffer and die for us, this is a representation of that. It pleased the Lord himself to bruise him. But in verse 11, it seems like as if the sun appears. The sky clears up. Abraham, not only once, but twice. Abraham, Abraham. Twice his name. Here am I. Lay not thine hand upon the lad. Can you imagine the relief? Can, can you imagine when you're ready to offer your son as a sacrifice and, and the light goes on and somebody says, no, don't do it. The relief that Abraham must have felt. Don't do him any harm. Isaac is rescued. The command to offer him as a sacrifice was intended only for a trial, a test. And it's the most wonderful news you could ever hear of. Abraham has not only approved, he's applauded. Now I know, verse 12, thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. Another sacrifice is provided instead of Isaac. Verse 13, And Abram lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. So Abram goes and takes the ram and offers him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. This place then got a name. Jehovah Jireh. You know what that means? The Lord will provide. The Lord will provide himself a lamb. So I got some points I want you to ponder tonight. Have you ever been tested? Do we trust that God will provide for us when we are? Is there something in your life tonight that is worth more than God is? Is there? That's actually what the test with Abraham was all about. If there was something in Abraham's life that he loved more than God. What is it in your life that you love more than God? What is holding you back? Does the Lord not desire that, that our faith deepen? Does he not want us to let him take control of what we think we own or things that we think we own or things we control? Even our children? (coughs) 
Jesus asked Peter in John 21, what did he ask him? Lovest thou me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Abraham had learned many things in his life. He had learned to obey God regardless of whether or not it seemed right to him. We have to remember, God did not force Abraham to offer his son. It doesn't tell us that anywhere. Abraham could have refused. Somewhere the believer still has a choice. We have a choice. But Abraham had learned that to disobey God was wrong. When God told him to do something, Abraham doesn't even seem to ask questions. God told him, go offer your son, he would do it. But his faith was in the fact that he knew that somehow God would provide. He didn't know how, but he knew somehow. And you know what? That's quite the faith. What a wonderful faith. Even if he didn't know exactly how, God's supply came at the point at just the right time. God will provide when we need it. Now I know this story has a good ending. Maybe your story doesn't. But I know that God will provide. Somehow he will provide. And you know, sometimes maybe we think God isn't fair. And, and I thought of that with Abraham. We, we have a, we, we too, we have a tendency to look around us and, and we see other Christians maybe aren't challenged the way that we are. And I, I think, well, maybe Abraham was thinking that too. He could have said, Lord, I've been through enough. Isn't there someone else you can work on? But no such response came from his lips. And I believe the reason why he knew God's supply for his life was always made for his individual need. Always. But Abram had learned many things over the years. And one of the greatest things I think that he had learned was this fact that he knew God cared for him. Abram had given everything he had to God. And if we read 1 Peter 5 verse 7, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to cast all our care upon him. You know why? Because he cares for you. He cares for me. And that's one of the first or second steps of faith that we need is to realize that God cares. God does care. And we must give him all our cares. Past, present, future. All of them. Not keeping any back. Not the little ones. You, you can't keep the little ones either. Here in 1 Peter I think Peter had learned that God cared for him. And if you think of Peter's life, and I, I won't go to all the scriptures, but Peter had learned a lot of things in his life walking with the Lord. If we just think of a few things of, of how Jesus healed Peter's uh, mother-in-law, or how he gave him that uh, great catch of fish. I think you read that in Luke how he helped us pay his taxes. Or what about when he walked on water? Peter had learned a lot to trust God and that God would care for him. Or what about when Peter cut off the ears of, I guess, Malchus? And how the Lord restored that. Peter knew that God would take care of him. We turn to 1 Peter, read a few more ver few verses there. 1 Peter 5. Just briefly. Just continue there. Where 
He says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Verse 7, 1 Peter 5, 7 says that. And verse 8, be sober, be, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that he hath suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. But the God of all grace, verse 10. You know what, brothers and sisters? It is only by God's grace. It is actually only by God's grace that we are saved. The Lord is gracious. Turn back to 1 Peter 2, verse 3. 1 Peter 2, verse 3. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So we are not to be afraid. Not to be afraid of anything the Lord desires from us. His grace is manifold. Turn to 1 Peter 4, verse 10. Next page, or two pages. 1 Peter 4, 10. As every man hath received the gift... Even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. It meets every situation of your life, everyone. If we submit to him. He gives us the grace that we need. In fact, he is the God of all grace. He has grace to help in everything. And he giveth more grace. And you know, we must stand in that grace. For whatever begins with God's grace, you know where it leads? It will lead straight to God's glory. If we depend on God's grace when we go through trials, when we are tested, then that suffering will result in God's glory. The road might not be easy. Actually, the road could be very difficult. But it leads to glory, and that's the main thing. That's the greatest thing. That's actually all that really matters. As long as it leads to his glory. So I, tonight I want you to remember, God will provide. God will provide. I want you to remember that God cares. It doesn't matter what your situation is tonight. God cares about you. We must believe that. If, if we don't believe that, we will never have faith. If you want your faith to increase, if you desire a deeper life with God, you must believe that God cares about you and that he cares about your situation. Jesus was always reminding his disciples of what? Oh, ye of little faith. He would say that to them, right? Oh, thou of little faith. And those verses are just reminders of how it is with us. It's not hard to have faith or think we have it when there are no storms or no dangers in our lives. But then the test comes. And every one of us will be tested in different ways. And I know some of you are being tested. Then the test comes. And it doesn't take very much. And we begin to doubt. It's so easy to, to, to feel sorry for ourselves and to think that God doesn't care. Or do you think that God won't provide? And your commitment, my commitment, must be so strong, so solid, 
that we believe from the bottom of our heart that God cares about us. Even when everything seems to go against you, I want you to remember God cares. You know what? Jesus himself held fast to that belief. Dying, hanging on a cross, Father, he prayed, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then he said, not my will, but thine be done. He knew that God cared for him. Even though he didn't want to be where he was. Maybe not everything is going the way you want things to go today. But I want to assure you that God cares and God will provide. Our trials, our testing, I want to assure you one thing, they are only for a season. But the glory that results, you know what they are? They are eternal. God is still acting in creation to bring his children into harmony with himself. But it means that we, as his children, dedicated, totally, completely give ourselves over to God. And you know what, brothers and sisters? When we start to do that, things will begin to happen. Mark 11, verse 22 says this, have faith in God. You know what that means? That means trust him. Always trust him. Live in total dependence on him. True faith is based on his word. And his word reveals his will to us. He will provide. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. And Father, even though the scripture that was read today is a difficult portion for us to see Abraham offering his son, we thank you that you provided. Father, many that are here today, I'm sure, are getting tested. Father, give us the faith to see that you care and that you will provide. Your grace is always sufficient. May we stand in that grace tonight. Father, I pray tonight that we will give our lives just totally over to you. And as you provide, we would see your glory. May our lives bring glory to your holy name. Because in the end, that's all that matters anyhow. Help us to remember that you care. Help us to remember that you love us. Help us to trust you, Lord God. May you forgive us for our shortcomings. And may our faith increase. So that you will be glorified. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray, thanking you. Amen. Genesis 22, 15 and on. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abram out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, 
and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. God desires to show his power through testing, through storms. My prayer is that our faith would be strong enough that he could do that. God brings this testing, storms into our lives because he wants to show his strength and because he wants to receive glory. So my challenge to you tonight is this. Remember, God will provide. But my challenge is, is there something that God is asking you to do and you're not finding it easy to do this? Is there something that is hindering you? God will provide. I want you to remember that. God will provide because God cares. Trust his power. Don't trust in ourselves, yourself. Trust God's power. Allow the Holy Spirit to, to fill you and, and give you that power. Grace is always sufficient. May we pick that up. That grace. Never forget that. Never forget that. That his grace is always sufficient. I want to thank you for coming tonight. We close with a benediction. You're going to bow with me at Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now to him that is able to do, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Thank you for coming. May the grace of the Lord be with you. Remember, his grace is sufficient. God bless you.